Building the Future, Green Building in the New Millennium, brought to you by Sustainable Homes of the Future. Yeah. Our natural world is in crisis. Buildings emit 40% of carbon globally. We need solutions now. Join the conversation today. Welcome, everyone, to Building the Future, Green Building in the New Millennium, a podcast about everything uh, sustainability-related in the built environment and sometimes beyond, depends on the guest. Uh, I'm very lucky today to have with me Drew Pedrick, who is the founding principal of McTeague Architecture. Um, Conscious Architecture is your your tagline, and I'll ask you more about that in a little bit. Um, I noticed from your, uh, just doing a little bit of research, LinkedIn page and whatnot, that you actually, you started McTeague Architecture a while ago and then stopped it or maybe not. I'm going to, that's sort of my question, I guess. Um, And then you worked for some other firms and did a a bunch of other stuff and then came back to it. So I'm curious, uh, this is a twofold question, I guess. First Mm -hmm. off, you know, give us a little bit of rundown of how you started it originally and, and how it blossomed into uh, what it is today. Um, and then also, you know, how has just architecture in general um, and sustainable architecture or conscious architecture, your term, um, how has that evolved over your 35 plus years uh, mm-hmm. as an architect? Um, mm-hmm. And also uh, didn't want to fail to mention that Drew is a lead AP certified and uh, AIA architect. So thank you. not just a designer, but an actual architect. Here he is, <laughs> Drew Pedrick. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ian. And, and thank you. It was really kind of you to say 35 plus. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that off your LinkedIn <laughs> summary. Close sorry. to 40. <laughs> actually, it's been a long time that I actually stopped using, um, you know, it's like you're, that's like somebody with age, right? Uh, I'm not going to say what my age is. I'm just going to say it's something plus, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you have your 30th 30. birthday for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, but I've really loved what I, I'm, I am someone who loves what he does, thankfully, because I've been doing it a long time and uh, for, you know, conscious decisions, so to speak, to, to practice architecture. Um, I started out um, as a young kid, I really uh, like fell into loving architecture. So it was passion from about 11 years old or thereabouts. And um, ha- you know, had a sort of an arts uh, interest, uh, science interest, and it all kind of, you know, came together. And I studied architectural engineering um, because it seemed to make a lot of sense to me that it would be great to have both uh, a lot of engineering, structural and systems and um, construction and all that, along with all the architecture and design studios and um, anthropology and art history, all that stuff. So, uh, so it's great uh, founding uh, foundation. Um, for me to start out with sort of but a cross out- cross disciplinary uh, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. And the program I went to is, uh, wow, it's thriving today. I am, I'm very um, close to the people at, at Penn state where nice. I did this program and really great. Uh, and I, I'm passionate about the idea. So, but I started out as a lighting designer and the far- first five years, that's what I did at my grandfather's firm in New York. He had long since passed away, um, but I, I was there and then went on to architecture. Um, and somewhere along the way, I had a boss who said, you're going to start a practice of your own. You know, I, you know, like I can just, I can feel it. And uh, so sure enough, um, I did in the, uh, in the uh, early 90s, uh, began a practice. And about three years into it, I got invited to do some product design at the same time I was running the architecture practice and product design for us, which was lighting fixtures became a uh, wonderful opportunity for us to deal with scale Hmm. at a, at a crazy level because we were doing buildings, we were doing offices, we were doing houses and now we're looking at the nuts, the bolts and the screw type that's inside. Uh, a light fixture or how to cast aluminum to make a certain shape. You know? wow. and, and then from there we got into photographing 
the products. And then from that, we got into desktop publishing to create catalogs for the company that we were hired by. And in that whole uh, trajectory, I started another firm to do that work, and I called that McTeague. And I called it McTeague because that's my middle name, it's an Irish heritage, and I just at that time thought that the, uh, the craft, the guild, the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, effort, the work that goes into creating products, that just somehow or other connected with my Irish heritage. Like, I thought that was so cool. So, <laughs> uh, so cool. I did that a long time, and then uh, closed it all down, both the architecture, which was uh, another name, and McTee closed it all down and went to work for a very large firm, an international firm, was there for seven years, did a whole variety of project types. Um, it was at that firm um, that I got LEED certified. So I had always been practicing um, what, we, what we now refer to as sustainable design. Back then, we, you know, there were other terms. We were, organic, we really, organic architecture was, was one that was been around for a while, right? Right. Organic architecture, uh, design with nature, uh, environmental architecture, energy. You know, en energy was our big uh, topic, really. Hmm. Um, when I was running the practice, um, we, I, got, I interviewed for and got to do a branch bank for a, a local savings and loan um, as a project. It was a very fun, little, fun project in Darien, Connecticut, right in their main street. And uh, in the interview process, I said to the uh, CEO um, something about sustainability. What we were calling it then was something different. I was talking about, you know, all this in the environment and materials. And, and it, he just, his eyes glazed over, kind of, you know, like. <laughs> he just, I've had that experience I, as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so I realized that this is not going well for me to get this project, right? So I like, <laughs> zipped my lips and went back to talking about how we can get it done quickly and cost effectively and, you know, very um, appropriate things with a banker to talk about. Right. And, uh, and I got, you know, we got hired. And so we did the project and um, we just went about, my team and I went about designing it the way we felt was right, in addition to obviously suiting the client's needs and, and all that. So. At the end of the project, when uh, there was uh, when we had the ribbon cutting ceremony, opened the branch bank. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was well, nicely received. I looked at the uh, CEO and I said, "John, I have a question for you. Um, the utility company would like to know where the rebate check should go to me or to you." <laughs> <laughs> so that was sly. That was really sly. That's good. And he, and he said, "What rebate check are we talking about?" And I said, well, you know, we just designed all these things in a way that you got a utility rebate because we used the best energy, you know, we, we did our energy consumption work and we, we lowered it. So you, you said, yeah, that check goes to me. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't take 10% or anything like that. No, I didn't take, no, no. But what was interesting was at that time, and this was the 90s, um, yeah. the perspective that, that I took and we took, uh, I mean, as, as architects in Connecticut, a, a, a lot of us was... We, we had to look at it from a philosophical perspective, sustainable design, but we had to look at it from a financial perspective. And so the, the people that we needed to have aligned with us or aligned mutually were the, was the CFO in an organization. The CEO was like, if the CFO was okay, that was great, right? If we didn't have the CFO's backing for this, then it was seen as a, a cost addition as opposed to a cost benefit and so that model has of course it's still there today we always were, were you know concerned about first cost and, and life cycle cost and cradle to cradle and mm -hmm. all those things but at that time that was that was really a primary issue was first cost now it's much more yeah uh, so it's shifted and changed a lot and uh if i could just ask a quick question here what you know what what was your did you have a pitch for the CFO? I mean, did you, did you just try to keep it talking about the numbers and not so much about the energy side of things? Or were you actually doing the, the you know, cost cycle analysis and the payback period and, and things like that, even at that time? We, we, we would, um, as, a, as a team, we would provide that if uh, so uh, cost analysis work, um, Paybacks, ROIs, all that 
um, we would do it. We didn't do it directly as architects because um, because what we wanted to make sure of is that uh, all of our cost structures were really um, you know thought of uh, well researched you know mm -hmm. in the marketplace, and that was that would be a lot to put on our plates as well to make sure that all the costing is. You know, it's really uh, market leveling and, 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 and aware. So especially at that time. Especially at that time, right? I mean, today you can look up on you on uh, on Google and you can yeah. find out you know the average cost of this material. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, we would go to a book RS Means, big thick thing like this, and go like you know you look through the pages and go, okay, it says that, but it's all these all these things about the the area you're in, and don't use this number as a whole to. So we would hire cost consultants at the time we would, and the engineers would help with us so we did energy analysis work um, as a team we did cost analysis work as a team but we generally didn't pitch directly to a CFO it it would at best it would be if we were in the room with with um, you know a group of three or four people at the top mm -hmm. and that person was included so very cool and yeah. how has how has that changed you know like now now for your um, well, I'll, I'll let you continue your timeline because I know you worked for, for AECOM for a little bit and, and the, <laughs> versus what you're doing right now with your own business. I mean, that, that is a huge, uh, you know, multi-level <laughs> very, you know, they've got everything they're doing design, they're doing construction, they're doing, uh, you know, financing, they're doing, they're doing the whole, the whole gamut. So I assume that was a learning experience for you as well. It sure was. It, it sure was. Um, uh, and I'll come back around to answer that question by way of sure. explaining that um, when I closed my practice down, I did so to join a, f uh, a company that was not as large as AECOM, but, uh, but comparable, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, cons a consulting, uh, an international consulting business. And they're a business, you know, um, shareholders, you know, all, all that. They, they, uh, they really operated that way. I mean, it's the right thing to do for them. Yeah. Um, so what they wanted to do was uh, they wanted to grow architecture. And in uh, the late nineties, they, um, they kind of set out on this path to, to do that. They had architects in their, in their offices. They had about, let's say 10,000 people in the firm. Wow. Um, Most of the U S a little bit of international. And they hired seven of us around the U S to help them grow architecture. And, uh, so I ended up in the Southeast region, uh, leading architecture and building engineering for, uh, for the region for certain business lines. And that was, uh, that was great experience. I was there for seven years. Um, we did everything from offices to sewage treatment plants, wow. which you can imagine have a really, um, you know, their own, let's just say their own architecture. <laughs> yeah. Not a, not a lot, <laughs> but, um, we One that if you haven't worked in, I'm sure required a decent amount of kind of getting up to speed on that. Yeah, very, this was very technical work in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, but it was very satisfying, you know, too, right? Um, but a, along the path, um, we got asked once by, a, uh, by our office in Jacksonville if we could do a cruise ship terminal. <laughs> and I was, I was the lead. They, you know, they called me up and said, hey, Drew, can you guys do a cruise ship terminal? And of course, without a missing a beat, <laughs> what did I say? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah let's do it. <laughs> we could do that. Sure. Um, and I said that actually because we had a transportation business group, and we were doing uh, we were doing um, you know rail stations and things like that. So we understood people of movement. We understood the traffic flow and all that. So it was a it was a bit of a stretch, but not too far. That project for the Port of Jacksonville. Um, we completed it. It was a study, basically. Um, about a year after we did that, this firm I was with um, bought a small firm that did cruise ship terminals. Hmm. And uh, so I was asked to be the architect in the uh, transition of bringing them on board. And so I started to do cruise ship terminals and found out that they were really mad that we got that project that they didn't. And oh, really? so we became fast friends. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we you know many years later really close friends we've done a lot of projects together um i had the opportunity from that point to now to have done about 27 
or so cruise ship terminal projects around the U.S. and overseas. Wow. Uh, Hong Kong, um, Singapore concept design um, competition winners actually in China and, uh, and, um, and, and a, lot of, a lot of stuff that didn't get built and a lot of stuff that did get built. Um, so in that process, um, sorry, I'm telling a long story, but in that process. That's a fascinating one. I have lots of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. But I'll, keep, I'll let you keep going for a little bit. Uh, yeah. So the, um, that firm decided, that company decided that architecture was really not um, you know, not like the greatest return on their investment. Um, our, uh, our margins seem to be tighter than other business lines, hmm. like an engineering business line that did a sewage treatment plant or a highway could make a, could make much better margins. Cause as we always would say, I'm, I'm sorry to any listeners who feel otherwise, but, but we always would say, if you design the first foot of a highway, you kind of got it. <laughs> hey that's true i've never thought about that but yeah Me say actually i'm sure because i know there's a lot more you know involved but we was oh, okay you know of course they can make more money you know and so uh anyway uh the, the firm decided architecture was not such a, a, a strong element of their whole overall business direction so we all began to move on and i moved on from that point over to aecom um, because of the cruise ship work and because of their need to um, add new principal to their LA office, uh, mm -hmm. LA design studio and timing was great. It worked out wonderfully. And I ended up there um, uh, and really loved it. I was there for five years. My first project, which stayed all the way through was the LA police department headquarters, which, which was um, I think, I think the largest vertical construction building that the city of Los Angeles had done in a really long time, maybe wow. as much as 50 years. And uh, how lucky was I, you know, to, to be running that project. Um, it was actually mostly been designed already when I came on board, but I, but I led it through the rest of design and construction and, and uh, it turned out really well, it turned out really well, but it's very, very intense uh, working with the city of Los Angeles. And at the time, Mayor Villaraigosa, who in the midst of construction uh, decided that all projects for the city of Los Angeles, um, all building projects would have to be designed to lead silver or better. And we That's were under contract. Yeah. yeah, it was an interesting mandate. So we, um, so sustainability, you know, there we are. Yeah. Now sustainability is, is coming in as a contractual imperative. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a goal. It was like, no, you have to do this. That has to happen. Well, for the first time, it probably wasn't you guys, the architects being like, hey, we can, you know, here are some options for how we can do this. You're, it's the other way around. It's a client actually, you know, telling you, hey, this is telling us, you better do this because that's our goal. We're going to make this happen. Are you on board? What year was yeah. that? Uh, that was um, 2007. Okay. Yeah. That, that's yeah. that wheelhouse that 2006, 2007 was, was when everybody kind of. Yeah. On the government end started to say, oh, yeah. Yeah. Net zero is possible and, you know, probably necessary for the survival of our cities and, and country. Absolutely. And everything that goes with all, all that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, uh, we can get into this discussion, but there's a lot of uh, checking boxes in something like certifications, like LEED, right. you know, which is, which is a, a little questionable potentially in terms of people's motivations. You know, right? Is this really about designing something that's designed holistically, uh, integrated? You know, really embodying all those things which, which in fact build to sustainability, um, or are we looking at the back end of it and saying, "Hey, we want to be this score in sustainability, so go get those things done." Right. The city was taking a bit of that position, but they had to do that. You know, they had to say, "This better happen to all their people and and to us." Mm -hmm. Well, um, we thought that was great, but it was also f really scary because um, <laughs> we had been designing the building to be LEED certified. Now the city was saying to us in construction, this has to be silver at least. Oh man! So the first thing we did, we sat down and we had a charrette. Yeah. A charrette, you know, a, a session, a working session of, a, of all the uh, necessary people in the project, important people, and um, figure out how can we get to silver? 
And what we found through the process was, you know, there's a chance we can get to platinum. Wow. And uh, we were kind of like, well, that's surprising. Wow, like pat on the back. Well, if we, could, we think we can get to platinum. And so, uh, so I can tell this now because it's like a lot of projects long done. <laughs> In that room, which included people from the city, we all were like, no, we're not going to say that. Don't say that to anybody. Because <laughs> we didn't want to set that bar right up there, right? Like that, it might happen, but, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, try to impose that. Right. As something has to happen. Um, and, and it costs a lot of money. At that time, going from lead certified to lead platinum was something you really almost couldn't do for a project that was already designed. You know, mm -hmm. keep in mind this building, 500,000 square foot building on an entire city block with levels of parking and security as you, you know, as police headquarters below mm -hmm. ground, um, very imposing structure in a way. It was already designed. Now we have to change it. How far can we change it when, when, the, when the hole's already dug out there? An enormous hole in the city, right? Right across from City Hall. Like, uh, make it more sustainable? <laughs> really? So what were some of those strategies? Like, what were the big three strategies that you guys were looking at at that point, um, you know, for, for how to, I mean, clearly you had some because you, you were going from certified to, you know, potentially uh, platinum. How, did, how were you able to, to realize that or how, how were you able to think through that? Well, uh, we looked at the entire list, of course, um, and, and we, we did a session where we said, um, you know, kind of A, B, or C, yes, no, and maybe, you know, that sort of thing. And, and kind of ran all those possible scenarios and ran scenarios. And then we all kind of broke out and went, okay, so the engineers, would go, you know, look at, can they, is it too late to change the mechanical systems or to what extent can they change these systems? You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, what happens to the energy usage? Can we really drop that adequately? Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Uh, another one was where where do we get power from? Where's, hmm. power, where's you know where's, what's the utility source? What's and the can source, it be yeah. renewable? And that um, which ultimately ended up being one of our our points was uh, a challenge for the city, not us, because where you get your power, of course, is the utility structure. Mm -hmm. And the utility structure was just, just getting to the point where they could consider offering renewable power hmm. because the grid was at that point, 2007, eight and nine, the grid was really becoming more sophisticated and allowing for uh, power sources to come into the, the grid that could be, that were renewable. Not only were they actually coming online, but were the, uh, were the technology systems in place to account for that power being in, in the system in a way that people could legitimately say, we are uh, designating this percentage of our utility costs to be based on renewable sources, which is like, there's a lot of electrons flying around in the power yeah. grid. How do you know where they're coming from? You have, it's, it's a, it's you a, have to have that infrastructure in place uh, yeah, and that, that human program exercise. in place. Yeah. Right? It's a human exercise in establishing a method that accounts for it. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And well, and, and it's worth mentioning uh, that I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, Los Angeles and California in general tend to be on the, the leading edge of uh, renewables, clean energy, things like that. So I imagine that that was probably something specific that Los Angeles was doing at that time that maybe not every city in the country was uh, was wrestling with or was was mandating i, I don't I, know for sure uh yeah i would i would say um la at that time la was in a, a really great position to do what they needed to do to get past what had been um you know old methodologies old standards old business and operational structures um mm -hmm. to go to go into this new world and this project happened to be one of those, which was uh, uh, catalytic, you know, for yeah. the utility for LEDWP to the turning point for sure. It was it was yeah, it was definitely part of the you know the battle the uh, the uh, aircraft carrier turning. You know, yeah. another. <laughs> and uh, that was fascinating for us to watch that because first we thought, well, that's an easy one, wind power, right? It's right <laughs> over the line. It's like not even over the line. Like just drive to. Palm Springs, they're all over the place. 
Nah. Yeah, exactly. So that was one, and uh, energy usage was another, and then the third one was materiality, and material choices and recycled content, and um, you know, f uh, following the chain of custody of materials through to account for it and all that, which when you look at a city like Los Angeles, like any city really, but it's a big city, how do they account for the process of accepting materials that they have not used before and accounting for the, the, the content correctly? So it can be, you know, it can be, um, we can document that after the fact. Mm -hmm. That material, 35% recycled content, great. This material had 10, you know, this material had, you know, whatever. And then sort of the, um, the whole waste cycle as well. So that required um, the Department of Building and Safety. That required public works. That required the fire department. That required everybody to go, we're on board. We're going to do this. And yeah. so it was really um, a great challenge. In some um, ways, that project really paved the way. I mean, it wasn't just a turning point, but literally like from an administrative uh, angle, it kind of paved the way for some of the legislation and some of the mandates that have have now come down since um yeah. including you know title 24 you know to be super uh topical and, and you know specific very much to yeah very much yeah and, and that's to great see how you know if you come into the city of los angeles with a project uh today a sustainable project that uses materials um that are let's say you know a, what would have been a bit unique back then today it's just part of the nature, right? Mm -hmm. like that, okay, so yeah, uh, projects like that, which was a, a very big building, um, well over $200 million, a total project cost with everything included of over $400 million. So that was a big project for the city. And um, we were always wondering through the process, is, are we gonna get there, right? <laughs> Lead certified, Lead Silver was the goal. We were mum about that platinum possibility. Well we got lead gold gold uh, nice okay so we were we we're all beside ourselves that we, we we knew we could get it as we went through the process because everybody was engaged including <clears throat> including the construction firm which you, you really can't get lead certified if you don't have a, a construction firm that's really engaged in it as well and partnering with you and you know understands that how important it is so uh so there's a uh, to me it's a really great moment uh for me personally and that's, there's a photograph I have of, of me and the chief of police at the ribbon cutting with the lead plaque behind us. That's <laughs> awesome. It turned out it was a fake lead plaque. We didn't have the real one. We actually had to <laughs> make, <laughs> we had to, you know, make one. Um, you called but, Hollywood. You called some set decorators <laughs> in Hollywood and said, hey, we need a fake lead. Uh, yeah. Plaque. Had it right in a snap. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You know, one of the things you mentioned, um, and we'll, I guess, eventually get around to the, the end of the timeline here. But one of the things you mentioned when you were talking about um, having done train stations and uh, I, I assume, you know, train stations, uh, cruise, cruise terminals, a police, uh, you know, a, a public uh, municipal building that's obviously going to have a lot of foot traffic, um, was that you, you guys were sort of thinking about the flow of people. And that's really cool to hear because I think that's unique to those larger style or municipal or, you know, transportation related projects where mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, in your current uh, architecture firm where you're um, doing mainly single family, I assume, uh, you know, I'm sure you have um, other stuff too, but. Yeah, a mix of commercial and, and residential. It's a mix. Yep. Um, but you're probably, I mean, even in a commercial environment, yeah, there's some flow involved. Yeah, you know but you're looking at maybe one little chunk of it and saying, okay, how are we going to manage this retail space? How are we going to manage this restaurant space or whatever? Whereas you're not looking at an entire building necessarily and saying, how is this flow of people going to be, um, you know, it's, it's almost more, more ominous in, in that larger building. What are some of the things that you're taking into consideration there? Um, you know, what is, what does it look like to think about the flow of people in a building? Yeah, um, and, and you hit it very well. Thank you. You're, you know, the difference between the large, a, a large building um, and the size of buildings we're working on today. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, 
the quantities of people are obviously there. Um, there, that is the difference primarily is the quantities involved. Um, for instance, I did um, uh, before I left ACOM, I did the uh, renovations to the headquarters of the Port of Los Angeles, hmm. and um, when we we were a lot of our work was focused on the public spaces. We were we were changing the approach coming into the building, and this was a 1979 um, building that uh, people at the time we were doing this were saying we're tired of this. You know, it's an old building, and you know. 1980, like that's an old building. Um, <laughs> arguably, it is now, old, yeah, exactly. Yeah, arguably old, uh, it kind of is. But um, our goal was to help them, uh, you know, breathe a new life into this building and to make it more appropriate to how people use a building like that today. And the presentation of the Port of Los Angeles to uh, kind of to the world. They're a, one of the largest ports in the world and one of the largest economies in the world. <laughs> Just yeah. them. You know, so so they had a lot um, invested in how they would present themselves in this process. So lucky us, we get to present them. <laughs> and so um, part of presenting them was, of course, being that they were uh, that they are um, also a security risk, because you can only imagine what would happen if something bad uh, happened at the Port of Los Angeles. You yeah. know, trade all those billions could be uh, jeopardized. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so security was a huge issue. And so what we had to do is we had to figure out how to make the lobby really a wonderful space to come into and enjoy, not anything like it had been before, which was a small and dark space that you, you never wanted to sit inside there. It was just a, it was just a means to get you know, to somebody's office. We had to make it an engaging space, a space for people to um, be able to sit and wait and comfortably and enjoy the presentation of what that port meant to them and to the, to the world. Um, so we had to locate a security desk. We had to do all these elements of, create, of, of having security, but we needed to have flow through. So we did, uh, first time we've done, we've done this, we did a, a full-on pedestrian simulation, you know, computerized um, simulation of all of the foot traffic wow. through the building in like four or five different scenarios of very busy to very light. And um, so we have a, we have a, we have, now we had this data set of, uh, of, of like videos of little dots, you know, flowing through and where they would gather. And it's all about human nature and how people, you know, uh, how people experience their environment. How, how does one person, well, how, how do 125 people, <laughs> you know, when they're all together trying to come in the door, Mm -hmm. And so we designed that, that building, you know, to make sure that there was a certain maximum lag time from the point you got out of your car and stepped onto the curb and before you, you know, you got on the elevator. And so that was like, that's the most sophisticated way we've done it. Um, since then, I did a cruise terminal project with uh, other very large firms in Hong Kong. And we used similar simulation so software then to analyze 10,000 people going through a building and wow. getting off two big massive ships and you know getting out to taxis. Um, and is so, it just on the subway in Hong Kong where they like push people in with sticks or is it were, were, you, were you simulating that as well with those? Like, <laughs> we didn't use the stick no, um, it was stick method. Like, okay. We get a few more in. <laughs> so what if you paid for that cruise, right? 10,001. Oh, get on there. Quick, <laughs> the ship's leaving. <laughs> um, yeah, they're pretty amazing uh, how, the, how they deal with, with uh, traffic, with people. Well, and um, was the cultural, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the cultural aspect was something to be taken into consideration. Did you consult with sort of people about, about the culture and like how close, you know, closeness, uh, proximity, you know, how, I mean, here we are talking about proximity and stuff and it, it's wild considering the times we're in, but um you know, I'm, I'm curious because I know a lot of those folks wear masks, you know, already. And, and there's, there's a certain proximity that's assumed there that maybe isn't assumed um, in America where we have more space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was over in, I was in Hong Kong six times for this project. And, um, you know, most of the time, um, if I was going to take the subway, there were people with masks. Mm -hmm. and, was, and that was 2009 
Yeah. So even then, that was the norm. And it was obviously because of the air pollution. Um, and what Hong Kong um, tends to suffer or tended um, was um, a, a sort of stifling kind of quality to the air, you know, the lack of flow of air. So that was a big, that was a big issue for them. And so the air quality was just like, okay, the, you know, buses and cars and taxis all going down the street. Well, the air doesn't go anywhere. Mm. So their, their degree of pollution was not necessarily related specifically to the amount of traffic. It was the fact that it, the air wasn't going anywhere, you know, and New York city is a, a somewhat similar, but if you look at New York city and Hong Kong, they, are vastly different, uh, yet we look at New York as being a very dense, you know, probably our densest city in the US, United States, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was an issue for them there. Um, coming off of a cruise ship, it was not that, it was um, safe passage. You know, we, we want you to enjoy yourself. When you're leaving the cruise ship, we want you to get out safely and efficiently. And, um, you know, we as designers want to satisfy the tourism aspect of this, that people, if they, if they think, well, I'm going to go on a cruise again, where should I go? Yeah, I want to go to Hong Kong. That was great. Mm -hmm. Or never again. Yeah. So uh, creating so, that uh, memorable experience, that positive, memorable experience. Yeah. But, and this is interesting, um, maybe, you know, pertinent today, one of the things that we had to do was we had to provide a way for every passenger coming off of a ship. And again, these are maximum of like 5,000 passengers every one of them could have their temperature taken as they pass by someone with one of those little point and shoot, you know, thermometers, right? Fascinating. And so they would pull someone out of line if they caught that their temperature was outside the range. Wow. And so there was a whole health check that they did. And so when we look at COVID today, yeah. They were, this was 2009, so this is 11 years ago. They were already, we designed a building to allow them to do that. So um, that's become a norm in a lot of places. It, it, internationally, um, that's, a, that's a more of an issue. In the US, we hadn't previously been doing health checks. Um, that might be a really good uh, skill to, you know, have on your resume come the next that, couple of years, yeah. you know, the, with, with bigger <laughs> buildings over here. Yeah, so that, you know, it's kind of fascinating when you, when you look at the work that we're doing now, and you know, one of the larger projects we worked on was the legacy headquarters for Davida Corporation hmm. in El Segundo. This is a few years ago, um, about 50,000 square feet, um, really houses about 225 employees. So that's not very much really when you think of what we were just talking about. Right. Um, but uh, but that, you know, we were very concerned about flow in that building. We were very concerned about um, how are people experiencing the building when they come in? Do they have an intuitive appreciation for what, where they're going next and why? And uh, we, we looked at what had been, we did a renovation basically of the whole space to suit the new needs. And what we looked at was, wow, where, are the, where is it really confusing here? And where is it really small when it should be large? Where is it closed where it should be open? Where does it need to be private and quiet so it's productive? And where, does it, where is it okay to be boisterous and energetic and, you know, and lively? And so- When asking those questions, um, how have things changed? You know, now, that, now that you have so many new tools, you have you know, uh, building information modeling, you have you know, uh, these, all these new energy modeling tools, all these new uh, simulation tools, uh, you know, how has that discussion or that conversation changed from the days where you, it was just a couple, couple guys around a table, you know, with pencils and protractors and, and draft paper? Well, um, in, if, in one way is that um, our ability to, to, deter, to, to incorporate new information is, you know, it's just like it's, there's, no, there's no comparison. Yeah. today to what it was like then um you know for obvious reasons the amount of information that, it, that we have at our hands um as quickly as we can put it in our hands that's which is instantaneously you know pretty much right we mm -hmm. can make use of that so uh, um back back in you know earlier days right um it took effort and time 
to determine, you know, to, to, to research something and to, and to determine what the factors were, let's say, in a condition, and then make assumptions, you know, draw conclusions from that and design around it. Um, the good part of that um, was that, w that uh, ideas gestated, mm. you know, so that they had time to evolve as we went along and, and grow and mature to something. Um, so maybe in some ways we might have felt more assured because we spent more time with it as human beings to, to the extent that we, you know, can comprehend things and work through problems collectively. We have the time mm -hmm. today, you know, as, as, uh, uh, as you, I'm sure, you know, with, with your reading, uh, and otherwise, you know, there, the, the ability for us to comprehend the information is way behind the amount of information that exists. We, yeah, it's, it's all, all data. It's all analytics now. And, you know, somebody can plug a number in and say, oh, well, this is going to be the result. And what's interesting is that that may or may not be true because, yes, numbers don't lie, you know, when you're talking about financials and when you're talking about certain things. But when it comes, I mean, architecture at the end of the day is an art. You know, it's, it's, it's design. It's, uh, it's yeah. not just numbers. You know, it, it, there's science and math and all that involved, as you, you mentioned. Um, but, but, yeah, I, I do wonder sometimes if, if it's almost like, in the attempt to sort of move things forward, you've, you've almost dumbed things down slightly, um, you know, to the point where maybe you're not getting all of the information. You think you've got more information than you could possibly handle, but in fact, you're maybe missing a couple things. And, and so it's probably good to have the old guard, guard around that remembers those times and says, wait, hold on, maybe we should give this another, you know, another pass or another thought. Yes, yes, it, it, it's, a, it's a little like, you know, um, as we're looking at vaccines for, uh, for, for the coronavirus, um, the scientific method mm -hmm. versus the political uh, 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 immediacies, mm -hmm. right? It's good. This is almost certainly to be a cure, right. right? Oh, absolutely. You know, we hear all this kind of talk, you know, it's, oh, you know, let's start buying, let's start making that stuff. Whereas the scientists are saying, oh God, you know, oh man, we really have to you know, go through this process because it needs to go through these steps. Um, when you look at buildings and you look at architecture, which of course last a long time, we really don't like to be wrong. That's, that's awful. The yeah. worst thing, you know, like the worst thing you can do is, is design something that lasts that you don't like. <laughs> yeah, I know. Your name is going to be on it for all of eternity. Yeah, right. 100, 100 plus years or whatever. <laughs> It's almost better to design something you love that's going to fall apart than you know, design something <laughs> you hate that's built to last. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so, um, I wanted to, I wanted to take us and kind of transition a little bit um, over from we were talking about flow in the larger buildings and uh, but I'm I'm curious because you know you and I met our, our company um, uh, and my boss was was doing a design and you were the architect uh, for the design and you guys I know had a lot of discussions in designing that project um, about flow and that was a single family home. So how, how does that approach, how does what you've, you know, the bigger buildings that you worked on with the larger firms, um, cruise terminals and all that, how do you distill that down and actually apply that to uh, a smaller building or a smaller space? Um, is it easier? Is it harder? Uh, what are the tools that you use to kind of, you know, because, because at the end of the day, when we're talking about sustainability, we're going to get into more sort of like specific things there, but we're talking about sustainability. You're, you are, you're, you're trying to manage flow because the more compartmentalized the space is, the more mechanical ventilation and, you know, all of these systems that you have to have. And so if you can simplify the design to some degree, um, I imagine that you can simplify some of the systems and therefore some of the, the energy and, and that's a method certainly of efficiency as well. It's not just, Oh, we want it to flow so that it you know feels nice. You know, it's like, yeah. this is actually going to give you some, uh, some, some feedback energy wise as well. Yes. Yes. And that, that house, um, well, that house, when we look at flow, we, we, we looked at flow from, um, well, let's say a, couple, a few different ways we've thought about the word flow. Um, the, the one was 
obviously the, uh, the occupants of that home. Mm -hmm. We would want that flow to have uh, a, a value to it that maybe we can't prescribe specifically because we don't know exactly who that owner is going to be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so we're, we're guessing a little bit. So if we, you know, imagined ourselves as being the, the person living in that space, how would that be? Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, how, do, how would it feel? Um, how, how would it be comfort wise? How uh, would, would it create what we think of it? Would, would it, would it satisfy our values that we apply to a residence, to a, to a home? Would it satisfy those, you know, th those values? Hmm. So, you know, would, would there be, um, you know, a, a great sense of entry? What would that feel like? Would that be formal and processional, you know, and uh, very specific? You, know, you come here and you stop and you go through and there's another and, you, you know, processional and you've got, you know, options. Or, or would it be more organic? Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent a lot of time actually on the difference between grid and organism. So, you know, if you like a grid plans yeah. <laughs> are, are one thing. But if when you look organically at, at things and how, how nature does things, it's not a grid, right? It's a, it's a whole other way. And, and look how well nature works. So, well, and bio, biomimesis, biophilia, like those, those are terms that, you know, that I've heard thrown around a lot in the green building and the sustainable architecture space. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, even down to what, what we've talked in some of our podcasts about color and I mean, you're talking more shape, but, but color mm -hmm. and um, texture mm -hmm. and I mean, all of these different yeah. senses. Yeah. Um, that we have as, as human beings. Yeah, exactly. We, so we, we actually, um, we actually superimposed both. We, we actually attempted to integrate the two different ways of looking at it. Very cool. Um, so if you look at just, you know, imagine the circle and the plus sign in your mind, you know, and you put them together mm. and then you imagine you're doing this entirely through um, a 2000 square foot floor plan that is mimicked up and mimicked down. So, you know, you've got vertical as well, that, that nature to work with too. Um, but you look at how those two work with each other. So the sense of that house was really attempting to um, have an, uh, a degree to which it looked contextually appropriate for its neighborhood, for its environment and its scale, um, that you, you had a certain amount of procession and, and mm -hmm. feeling of I'm going through a gate and I'm stepping up and I'm turning and I'm you know, coming to the door. But as you did that and you went through, um, and Ian, you've seen these plans, so I, I don't yeah. have to tell you in detail. You see <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, the sense of being able, the, the feeling of being able to flow off into the kitchen and from the kitchen straight out, in, or not straight, but let's say, you know, organically um, mm -hmm. out into the patio, into that interior courtyard and mm -hmm. up to the, the spa and back through the rear and so all of the flow was thought of not with like straight lines it was all the flow was thought of as you know branches of a tree mm -hmm. and that kind of thing that was you know, more cool. analogous to that i like that um we, that and, way. and how many how many projects are you really going that deep on when it comes to uh you know single family homes <laughs> Uh, is that is that a norm or is it like a sort of one in one in five or you know if you had to guess? Um, it's very it, it, um, in in a way it's every project, but in other ways that, uh, that's very singular. Um, mm -hmm. And and I mean um, that was a that was a, a, a confluence of of a client, a project, a team, a time period, right? All work together to create that. And we can copy that. We can, we can mimic that, you know, we can um, expand and go and do other ones like that, but yeah. it's very rare for all that to come together. Um, I, for instance, we just, we just finished a house that clients have moved into and um, we, we never had a conversation about organic versus, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, walls and straight lines and all that. We didn't have that conversation. Yeah. But 
we're human beings. And so the conversation becomes, well, should this be open? And, and uh, does, it, does it seem right when you're in the kitchen? And can, do you want to look out from the kitchen and see the people who are watching TV and doing, you know, doing what they're doing, lounging? Do you want to have that space be um, where it could be just you and your kids? Or you could have 20 people there and have, you know, have a big party. But, mm-hmm. So when you put it in that language, which is very normal language for a home, um, a lot of it's already there. Yeah. You know, it's really what we're trying to do. And a case like that house, that house uh, had an existing footprint. We were taking a house and we were essentially taking the old house away, but putting a new house in its place on the exact same footprint with many of the same features. So our limits were definitely much greater than saying, we have a property, it's this big, and the house is going to be that big. Well, we wanted, what do we want to do? Right. So we have a house in... Um, uh, it's a fire rebuilt house that we're working on right now. And uh, we're just shifting from a direction we had been going, which was to use the old footprint, which seemed to make sense. We're rebuilding from a fire to saying the land is telling us to do something very different. Interesting. Let's, let's look at the land now. Hmm. And it was hard to get, you know, in a way to get to that point because the urgency is like, build that house, you know, it burnt down, put it back. And uh, well, wait, <laughs> so, you know, so we're, we're changing the flow of that house. It's a house, it's a land that goes down, mm-hmm. it goes back up. So we're using both sides. We're, cool. we're actually using this slope and we're putting something over here that can look back. So it has outbuildings. So you now get an appreciation of a, a real three dimensional appreciation of the entire land and the views as opposed to, well, the house was here and it had, it had some great views, you know, it was okay. It was great. You know, we loved yeah. it to no, you can have, you know, you can have whatever you want there really. So let's maximize, let's look at the flow of air, the direction of light, uh, temperature. Let's look at, you know, the kinds of plants that are there. Let's mm-hmm. deal with the fact that the early end goes down and comes back up. So there's a natural water course at the bottom. Mm. at certain times and so you know so the the nature is shifting constantly from a wet year to a dry year to and you get to actually experience that then in the design you know we want you to experience that yeah through the house through through what we do with the land to create a home that's really cool and and i mean for anybody that's not familiar you know site specific design is kind of what you're what you're talking about and um yeah i think that leads us into you know, it's, it's about being conscious, you know, your tagline is conscious architecture. And I was going to ask you, you know, basically a question of like, what do you see as the difference between conscious architecture and sustainable architecture? Is there one, or is it just sort of two different lenses through which we're kind of looking at the same, at the same idea? Conscious architecture. Um, I, I began to use that language about a year and a half ago. Um, and it, it came out of a few things. Um, one being that the maturing aspect of things like lead certification as a, as a tool, mm-hmm. you know, as lead's been around now for 20 years, um, to other, other uh, certifications like well building certification, mm-hmm. living building challenge, you know, all of these are, are systems that exist out there for us to you know, make use of in terms of how we, how we are making choices, yeah. really. Yeah, and not, set, a, set a framework not, for, for how we make those choices, really. Yeah, exactly. It's less about design as a, as a core methodology. It's more um, a framework and, a, and a, a way to make choices. You know, this, is, this, this takes more energy. This takes less energy. This costs more. This costs less, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I was feeling like, for me, um, and, and by the way, we just finished a uh, design concepts on a project where we were uh, adding a third story to uh, an old unreinforced masonry building that needed a new structure, steel structure inserted into it because wow. we couldn't touch them. We couldn't put any weight on the brick. <laughs> yeah. In Los Angeles. So in, in an earthquake zone, in a liquefaction zone, in fact, where oh my gosh. there's a big earthquake, the, the land just becomes basically like a, like a lake, you know. Wow. So, here we are, we're, we're putting another, you know, 
uh, we're, we're adding to this building. How do we do that sustainably? Um, we created a grow center so they could grow their own food. Mm. We use, we applied um, atmospheric water generation equipment into it so they could make their own water. Incredible. And everything is being powered by the solar skin on the entire top addition. So power from the sun, water yeah. from the air, uh, composting toilets, uh, you know, nothing was leave, nothing would be leaving this building. And so we, we took that project as far as our client was ready to go before he had to park for a while and, and then hopefully he'll come back and do it. Mm -hmm. Um, in that process, um, you know, what I was realizing was that uh, I think we've kind of run, run to the end in a way of the, of, of the kind of increasing value of more and more things like lead. I mm -hmm. felt what was missing is more of the connectivity, mm -hmm. more of a natural approach, more of a, a, a biological approach to design, you know, as opposed to a more technical, more humanistic approach to design. Which if we're so, talking about building certification is more the living building challenge approach than the, than the lead. Yes. Less check yeah. boxes and more, Hey, this is, um, you know, holistic as you've said, holistic a couple of times. And I, yeah. I say that a lot too, you know, holistic approach, dare I say <laughs> spiritual even, yeah. maybe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. For the right yeah. person or the right client. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is, um, you know, yeah, that's, we could have another call on that one. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We'll save that for part two. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really uh, so true. Um, but at the same time that was happening, uh, I also was, um, you know, there's a point um, not uncommon in our business where we kind of have to decide whether the, the base of clients we have should include many of those whose goal is primarily financial, mm -hmm. which is great, right? Business is business. We live in a capitalist world. You know, um, uh, uh, our, our, our transactional methodology is money. Yeah. That's how, right. That's, that's the system we got. Uh, so I get it. Um, but I have felt over, you know, my own years that we're reaching a point where, um, you know, the, the, the three legs of the stool, economic, social, and environmental, were off, way off balance. And they were tipping because the economic leg was gigantic mm -hmm. and the others couldn't keep up with that because it controlled every decision. Every decision is like, is this enough? Is this the right amount of money? Is this too much money? Is it, you know, material choices were being made on money, you know, basis and all that. And so what I, what I began to think is that we could, we, my team and I could shift our practice to um, social followed by environmental or maybe the other will lead to good economics. So that says there are certain clients we, we or certain projects we do not take on mm -hmm. because they are primarily economic driven and not bad necessarily, but if we're looking at the time that we have on our plates to do things that we think are valuable to our clients, let's, let's pick those that we, we think are, are, are better for us and better for our planet. It's, you know, serve a, a larger purpose. So, um, as I was coming to that realization, um, the, I was also coming to the realization that there is a lot of business out there that calls itself conscious business. Um, and, and there are organizations that are about conscious capitalism, right. you know, conscious investing, uh, all of that language. Social uh, impact investing. Yeah. Things like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, work that's being done at the United Nations to look at conscious development internationally, you know, across, around the globe. Mm -hmm. All of that said, you know, for me, it said, wow, so we really need to practice conscious architecture so that the, you know, we are embodying those aspects of it and we're really thinking with our clients about uh, social and environmental values. And, and to those clients, and I have some who, who in fact have a developer client, um, great, great fellow, great business and is, that is exactly where he is. His goal is to develop things that only do so in a way that serves, uh, you know, a good reason, you know, good benefits to, uh, to society. So that's, that's the goal. That's awesome. I like that. And I think what's really cool about it too, is that 
you know, it sets the stage for that conversation at the beginning of, you know, a meeting a, a potential client even, you know, before you've even gotten to whether or not you're going to take the project or not, you know, you, you have that mandate in your business now to say, Hey, we're going to have this conversation because, you know, I don't, I don't want to just blindly say yes to something. I want to find out what your project goals are, what your, um, you know, what are your top five uh, elements that you care about here? You know, is it sustainability? Is it energy? Is it, uh, you know, aesthetic? Is it, I mean, there's so many different um, realms of architecture and building design that, you get to have those conversations and in some ways kind of educate the clients a little bit as to what's possible. Um, because I, I think personally, you know, the reason we started this podcast was to try to just keep this conversation going, um, especially with everything that's going on right now. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're at a, I think another turning point, um, you know, maybe, maybe right around 2000 or some, some around 2006 was a, a turning point where, the information was out there. Some of the technology and the tools were out there. A few key players, you know, started to see it. It was picking up steam. But, you know, I really feel like what you're doing and that social impact um, piece of just business in general, but specifically buildings and development, um, there's so much opportunity to make an impact. And yeah. you can't do that if you're scared to have those conversations. You can't do that if you're scared to have a client say, well, you're full of hooey. Like I'm going to go with this other guy who's told me that they're going to bang it out in six months and you know, it's going to cost X. Like you're, you're looking for the right client. You're looking for somebody who wants to partner with you. And, and I really respect that a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I tell you, what, um, um, which I found immediately once I started to, to really put this language out there um, and to join into some organizations uh, like um, a little, a little plug, I guess, uh, conscious capitalism, LA Mm -hmm. uh, chapter Uh, conscious capitalism is a national organization in the LA chapter. I went, I joined immediately once I realized it was there. And then I went to one of their meetings and um, you know, year and a half later, I can tell you every time I'm with that group of people, I mean, it's changing group of people because it's an organization, but every time I'm in that setting, uh, everybody has a passion about what they're doing. So the energy is really very positive and somebody could be making, um, you know, cookies and they're doing it in a way that a portion of their proceeds goes to help people in somewhere, mm-hmm. uh, inner city or in another country or something, or, you know, uh, or in education, you know, um, you take a business. And so these, um, like a benefit corporation, like B corporation, yep. you know, that has a, a social purpose to it as well when you're working with people like that, there is an energy and an enthusiasm in the room that isn't necessarily in others. And there is an openness to new ways to approach a problem or a condition situation, because, you know, this is a group of people who are already saying, wow, if I can do this, which is so cool, I'll do well enough that I can do that with it Mm -hmm. also and help those people. And And, hire people and grow the business so that I can provide more jobs, more good jobs. And yeah. 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 There's a, you know, there's a, uh, there's a a vertical grow business in Jackson Hole, Wyoming that I've come to know a bit about. And they hire people who, uh, you know, who have learning disabilities and and other sorts of disabilities. And, you know, that's not new. People are doing that. But when you look at how they are operating, um, there is such joy, such pleasure that is is in that side that organization that who could say no to why would you not want to work there why wouldn't you want to be a part of that look yeah. what they're doing and so those people are who are who were not necessarily getting trained not getting access to uh to things that many other people are you know and we could say that's maybe a different kind of privilege but these people who are now allowed to um participate were um building strengths that people didn't think they had, you know, they were going on to take levels of responsibility, which then other people could come under them in the organization, you know, so there's uh, like, there, there's so many companies like that who are in this kind of space that uh, we want to work with people who think that way. We want to work with people who live and operate that way and, and do, uh, you know, there was, that's, that's the building we want to do. 
you know, we wanted to, we're, we're, we're doing a, a cannabis um, a business right now. And this cannabis business started by giving um, medical grade cannabis um, mm -hmm. under medical supervision to, for free to people who, who are epileptic. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so that, you know, it was, it was on a trial basis, mm -hmm. but they took those results, which were demonstrable, were very positive, and they lobbied Congress. Wow. And they built their business by doing that, by doing good work, you know, providing value and helping with others to change legislation to allow for something which cannabis. Now it's like not really so bad, actually a great thing, right? In a lot of ways, but we all know the history of how, you know, how we thought about yeah. pot, right? No, yeah. helping people all over the place. And so that's a great organization to work with. We enjoy working with them and, you know, it's, uh, that's the kind of thing we're looking for more. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time here. So, so kind of start wrapping up, I guess, but I do have two, two questions. Um, and then a really quick one, anything, uh, with, with the cannabis one, like, is there anything unique about that particular project when it comes to efficiency or energy? I mean, I'm assuming if they're cultivating <laughs> there, then there's lots yeah. of water systems and lighting systems and things like that. Anything that was, that really kind of caught you as, as fun with while designing that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they are, they're working really, really hard to, uh, make sure that, um, that they can use led lighting instead of HID. Oh. HID is high intensity discharge. It's, it's the, it's what for, um, when I was a lighting designer, you know, a long time ago, HID <laughs> yeah. was like, oh, it's so great. It's energy efficient. And it's, you know, and, you know, fraction of the wattage of old incandescent light bulbs and fluorescent, much better. Now, like that stuff makes so much heat and right. uses so much electricity when you look at growing that you have to then include HVAC systems that you wouldn't have had. You know, you're, you're putting a mechanical system in there to deal with the lighting system you put in there. Mm -hmm. How stupid is that, right? It's like I mean, putting a Band-Aid on a Band-Aid, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> like you solved one problem and you created another problem with it. So now you're going to solve that by throwing something else on that, which, by the way, is going to take your energy usage up. Uh, you know, uh, so if everybody does that, we've created another problem. You right. know, we've created a, 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 a societal problem. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And so their point of view is that, you know, well, you want to do you know, LED lighting. Uh, it's not inexpensive, so it's it's a bit of a challenge for their bottom line to go through the process, and um, hopefully they'll be able to. And, well, and hopefully the payback, you know, over time will will help with that upfront cost. I mean, that's I know from the cost perspective, that's always one of those things is uh, to get buy in on the front end. You you really you have to do a lot of work um, with folks that yeah. either don't have the budget or you know aren't at that conscious place that, that you are and you know, that, that some people are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. That, that sounds interesting. Um, what two, so this is one question, but two parts, what's something that's really exciting uh, for you right now, you know, some sort of either technology or material or methodology that's um, that you think is really uh, about to sort of spring out into um you know, bigger scale, uh, and then also, and maybe, maybe we should, I should have asked it around the other way around, but, um, what's the biggest challenge when it comes to incorporating sustainability, conscious architecture, energy efficiency? Um, we've talked about cost obviously, so I'm assuming that's up there, but are, are there any other challenges, um, that, that you've found in trying to institute some of these sustainability principles in your designs and in your buildings? Um, so maybe start I, I think, with the challenge and then go with the uh, exciting. Yeah, I'll go, with, I'll go with that one first. Right. Um, I think the biggest challenge is today, um, at least in California, I'll speak for California because that's where sure. we're, we do most of our work. And the, uh, the regulations in California um, are such that we are almost designing to, uh, um, we're, we are in fact designing to a moderate level at least of lead certification and, the, and those other qualifiers out there. So from that point of view, we kind of do it. Right. Thankfully, right. Mm -hmm. It's in the code. You have to. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenge with this is um, that there still is um, uh, an historical and a, a kind of um, a cultural position against that or a cultural position, maybe to question it and look at it as uh, as a um, as an as a sort of um, 
in the in the realm of positives and negatives on a project, it's in the negative side of the line. You know, it's under the line. Having right? a lead certified building, having a, you having to do that, still yeah. viewed like that stuff costs, hmm. right? So so that is still kind of the issue in. in in most of our projects is that there's still in a sort of embedded, you know, undercurrent of language that is like fearful, um, you know, concern, not really clear what it actually means. Think it's a, maybe it's a little bit of hooey still, you know, that kind of thing still exists. So do you change your language then when you're talking to people and, and, and throwing some of the, those ideas out there? I mean, similar to what you did, you know, way back with the, the CFO and the credit union. Uh, I mean, do you just sort of stay away from certain terms and kind of like only give 70% of the information and like hold a little bit close to the breast and, and, uh, or, um, well, you know, what's your approach? Client selection, you know, our, our client selection is clients selecting us that, right. that relationship, how it builds really helps us avoid a lot of that. I think, cool. uh, you know, fortunately, um, but, but it's also, you know, some things you just do some things you don't, and, and other things you say, we do this because we have to. Like um, a project uh, and residential projects these days too, um, mm -hmm. at a certain scale have to do uh, LID, low impact development mm. work to their site. Where's the water going? You know, is there water going off site? How is it being stored on site? How's that first flush of a rainstorm where, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and so those things like if you're an owner, and you wanted to, you know, do something to your building or your home, and suddenly the, uh, uh, an agency saying, "I'm sorry, but you have to spend fifty thousand dollars more to put the system in." You know, you that's a that's a negative. Like, why are you doing that? I pay my taxes. This is a terrible thing you're making us do. Right. Uh, so, so there still is an in, a sort of a, um, an institutional or a cultural level of uh, worry, fear. Uh, you know, cost threshold way of looking at things. That's, those are the challenges I think we see today. We don't see challenges in terms of people understanding that the planet's better for it and it kind of is the right thing to do. Maybe it, you really believe it's the right thing to do. You know, we, people want to do recycling. People get water quality. They get all the concepts of it. But when you come down to like bottom line, I have to write checks for this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where it gets dicey. Um, the first part, the first question you asked what I think is really exciting today, and I, I'll, I'll point out two sources um, if anybody wants to, you know, w watching this, um, wants to think more about this. Um, I think we're going to very quickly, and I mean quickly like the next 10 years, um, get past a point of thinking about how we build buildings the old way, which is, to, you know, basically today. You, you, buy, you get all the parts and you nail them and you, you know, bolt them together. Um, that's today. It's been like that forever. Stick built, right? essentially. Stick built yeah. or, you know, or even pouring concrete. You know, you have to buy the concrete and you have to you know, put it in the form and, you know, all manual, right? Mm -hmm. That's been mankind. That's, that's, a, that's a human story, right? That's how we built. Right. To, okay, now we're really talking about... Um, you know, 3D printing a building. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now there's a machine, computer controlled, designed by people who are designing the building, you know, and all that. And yeah. it, it, it makes the building. Great. Um, except that, you know, uh, all of our buildings don't really want to look like sausages lined up, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, <laughs> that's got a certain kind of traction to it, certain limitations to it. It can evolve more. But I think where, I think where this is going is that we're going to grow our buildings. And that to me is the most exciting thing. And I'll point to um, MIT's Mediated Matter Lab uh, run by Neri Oxnard and um, Cooper Hewitt Museum. Great sources of information on this. And uh, I love them both. They're, they are, they're really at the forefront of both um, researching and devising ways to take Mary Oxnard and her team, um, if you might, and I don't know if you've seen this already, but if, if anybody re, you know, does it, you, looks up YouTube on it, you can see how they built a room using silkworms. Wow. So they create a framework, 
and they put silkworms uh, around it. And the silkworms basically, you know, covered the whole thing because that's what a silkworm does. It builds, you know, builds this cocoon where you could, you could sort of trick the silkworm into doing it this way across a surface. And that's taking nature and doing something with it, building a building, building a space with it. That's, yeah. you know, that's one example, right? They're doing all these other things which are essentially taking organic approaches to, to building. So uh, Cooper Hewitt researches, looks for those kinds of examples and it promotes it. You know, it's a, it's a very cool museum in New York that actually puts a lot of stuff out there that, uh, that is sort of in partly, uh, it's in that kind of space. So that's right. Very cool. So, so you think within the next 10 years, even though uh, everything I've read says it takes 10 years to develop a, uh, a product and then another 10 years to, to bring it to market. So you think, you think maybe we've sped that process along slightly now or, I mean, or the, the need of the times is such that, that there's uh, more energy and therefore more, more sort of, um, you know, expediency with, with some of these ideas? I think that, uh, uh, I, I think maybe that's, you know, crazy optimism on the one hand and I'll, hey, I'll that's great. I love it. For that. But I, but I would also say that, um, you know, as we look back in our own, in our histories, the times where we made, um, monumental change, you know, and particularly right, like right now, when we have done it, we've done it because there was an urgency. Oftentimes that was a crisis, which mm -hmm. could have been, uh, like the nature of the crisis we're, we're facing right now, pandemic. Um, but it's just, a, I think, a testament to human nature to shift when we really need to shift. And we don't have the planet saying it's collapsing on us. We better fix it fast. We still have the planet saying that, well, I think the planet's saying, if you guys don't make it, I really don't care, right? Like if you humans don't make it, you know, that's okay. Uh, well, I'll still be here at the planet. Um, you know, that kind of thing is, uh, is, is an issue where we can kind of continue to live on and on and on without facing it. But I think there are enough people who are saying, no, we have got to shift. So I'm hopeful that there's more shift that takes place so that the work that people like that are doing can take hold. Um, a year or two ago, we were not really talking about 3D printing homes yeah. or buildings. And I, you know, in that short amount of time, it's in the, it's in the every day of what we are architects and engineers see coming out there. So that's pretty fast. So I hope so. That's awesome. Uh, my name is Ian Sonnenberger. I've been talking with Drew Pedrick. Um, I'll let him do a, one last little uh, plug for his uh, architecture firm and anything else, you know, any other uh, websites or anything you want to throw out there. But I just think it's cool that, you know, this conversation is happening. I agree with you that, that this is a time where we have a real opportunity to shift the focus um, from the way things have been to the way things could be. Um, and so I just really appreciate your being here and, and joining me in that conversation. Um, why don't you uh, close this out here and then I'll, I'll say goodbye. Oh, well, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you enormously for, uh, for inviting me on as a guest on, on your podcast, on this show. It's, it's, it's really uh, great. Uh, it's really a great honor from my point of view to be part of this. Um, you know, we've, you and I have talked uh, about sustainability and specifics with projects for, uh, for as long as we've known each other. And so it's really a wonderful opportunity to, to, to see this um, grow and promote and get, you know, get out to more people. And so that more people can, can hear and think and, and communicate back. You know, yeah, contribute uh, exactly. That's that's the mandate, really. Yeah, it's like help so, us out. Tell us, tell us those new ideas, so we can, you know, if we don't know them, we can get them out there, and other people can know about them too. Yeah, and that's what I. I mean, I don't, I, I really um, did not intend to come on and plug uh, my business. I, 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 I will only say that um, I been, I've been doing this for thirty nine years, actually, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, got a lot more. I mean, I just love it, and I. I am very passionate about what I'm doing. I think there are enormous changes that are, are continuing to unfold. Um, and I'm ex really excited to be a part of that. So I am really hoping to find more people that are like-minded to work with and to develop more projects and 
do more more kinds of design and architecture and planning, placemaking, um, uh, you know, helping people to live, you know, with the planet and with each other and, you know, and in, in these ways. So thank you very much for your time. For yeah. you. um, what is your, I'll put it in the show notes too, but what is your, your website? Um, um, it's, um, it's mctigue.net, M-C-T-I-G-U-E.net. Perfect. And so if you want to get in touch with Drew, that's... Email me at a pedrick, a p e d r i c k at mcteague.net, and uh, I will I will look forward to that very much. Fantastic! Thank you so much, everybody, for listening, and thank you, Drew. Thank you. Take care. Building the future, green building in the new millennium, brought to you by Sustainable Homes of the Future.